uh, just FYI, I think for this presentation, I wanted to um, make sure it was uh, geared towards um, a couple of different audiences, um, kind of assuming that a lot of you have um, either some uh, or most mostly geo knowledge and maybe some uh, development or coding knowledge, or the other side of the coin, um, maybe uh, more coding knowledge, but not as much geo um, geo knowledge. So I'm kind of um, catering to to both, hopefully, and I won't be too advanced um, or too beginner um, on either side. Um, and also, my hope is to provide um, kind of a helpful context around um, around this topic. So a lot of a lot of what I talk about will be very contextual. Um, I'll have a little code in there, um, but mostly big picture and um, uh, expressing the ideas behind this. Um, so overview of what we'll be talking about, um, geoprocessing, just kind of what, what, that, is, what that is, um, why node for geoprocessing, um, and then talk about a couple uh, popular libraries used for geoprocessing, um, particularly Mapnik and GDAL, um, also known as Gadol, or I heard someone say Goodle the other day. Um, I say GDAL. Um, and then walk through a couple examples um, of what that looks like in Node um, and what you could do with it. So I'll, I'll mention a couple modules that, that use Mapnik and GDAL in Node. Um, and then also kind of a general how geoprocessing and the use of Mapnik and GDAL within Node um, fit into the larger pipeline at Mapbox as well. Um, and just a, just kind of a note, um, I'll be using terms, so Mapnik and GDAL. Um, I'm referring to like the native C++ libraries. Um, and then Node, Mapnik, and Node GDAL, I'm referring to the Node versions of them, so the JavaScript versions of them. Um, it just might be a little, a little confusing. Um, so geoprocessing, what is it? Um, essentially, it's manipulating spatial data in some way. Um, so taking um, an input data set, doing something with it, and creating an output data set. Um, and that could look like um, merging data, so taking two sets of data, putting them together, um, buffering, uh, reprojecting, converting the data type, or selecting features and doing some kind of analysis on them. Um, so transforming the data in some way. Um, this is also an awesome movie called Fifth Element. Um, and kind of a fundamental element of geoprocessing is the idea of automation. Um, so, and kind of the uh, a fundamental element within coding in general. Um, so automa automating the t these tasks. Um, so geoprocess repeat, geoprocess repeat um, for many data sets. Um, um, and let's see, and then just some examples of some tools you might be more familiar with. Um, Rasterio, it's a Python library that uses NumPy or NumPy and GDAL um, to process raster data. Um, also, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, you might, might also be familiar with GDAL OGR. Um, which is uh, used, you can use it in the command line or in a bash script um, in Python or even in C++. Um, and this is kind of what it looks like. Um, so GDAL info is kind of a common command that you might use. Send it a file, so this is a DC TIFF file or image and it spits out all of this metadata, so you might be familiar with that. Um, or if you're more on the software side, um, like Quantum GIS or ArcGIS, um, models is also a popular form of geoprocessing. And this is just a really, really crazy intense, intense model. Um, so if you're not familiar with GDAL, um, it's a library for reading and writing um, both raster and vector geospatial data formats. Um, and it's really good at, um, oh, and it's C++ and open source. Um, and it's really good at supporting lots and lots of formats. Um, actually, all together, um, I think it supports over 200 formats. Um, and some of those you might be familiar with, raster, geotiff, 
Mr. SID, JPEG 2000, Vector, uh, KML, GPX, Shape, PostGIS, um, and a whole, whole bunch of others. Um, it's also used um, in a variety of applications. Um, you might be familiar with some of these. Um, so it's um, basically, it's a key library for a lot of things um, geo-related. Uh, and Mapnik is also open source in C++. Um, it's a tool toolkit for processing and rendering a virtual map. Um, and Mapnik is really good at good, uh, at fast tile rendering. Um, and if you're not familiar with rendering, rendering is this idea of taking geodata and um, creating an image out of it or painting a picture um, based on the geodata. Um, some of the formats it, it supports, CSV, um, also raster, shape files, OGR vector, tile, vector files. Um, uh, oh, and also um, something about Mapnik. Uh, before, um, before I really started working with it, I had the idea that Mapnik was only about rendering, um, but actually um, you can use it to explore data um, which can be very powerful um, to peek into to what kind of file you're looking at. So, um, so why, why do you process um, using Node? Um, I think this depends a lot on what your use case is. Um, also, the topic of Node is pretty broad and can go pretty in depth. So I think um, uh, for this presentation, I'll just kind of do conceptual ideas around, around why Node. Um, uh, so what is Node? We'll do that briefly. Um, you, might be, you might be familiar with thinking of JavaScript as on the client side or in the browser. Um, this is um, D3. Um, working in the browser to create um, a cool interface um, and it interacts with the DOM and um, everything within the browser. But with Node, um, it's kind of like um, running, running, Node outs or running JavaScript outside of the browser, um, so server side. Um, so it's kind of like a command line tool um, that runs JavaScript on a machine um, without needing to run in the browser. Um, and this is basically um, executing node on the command line, and then one plus one is two um, as a simple operation. Um, and uh, kind of an interesting thing that took me a long time to really understand is that node, um, yes, it's node.js, you're writing JavaScript. Um, so it implements the JavaScript language, but um, in its foundation, um, it's written in C++. Um, so there's a weird kind of dichotomy. Um, so you can think of it as a bridge, Node being the bridge um, between the JavaScript world and the C++ world. Um, and this, this bridge kind of enables JavaScript developers to, to utilize the power of C++ libraries um, and to easily utilize something called concurrency. Um, and if you're not familiar with concurrency, um, it's basically doing many tasks at once um, using threads. Um, and you can think of threads as multitasking, um, so doing, um, doing a lot of things um, at once. Um, so yeah, so Node, Node makes it easy for developers to write code um, that processes jobs concurrently. Um, this is kind of a a layout of what that might look like. Um, so you have a process, and in that process, you have a number of tasks that are working its way down um, to be complete, working their way down to be completed. And you have four threads here, so there's four different options um, for those tasks to be completed. So that just makes it go go faster. Um, and uh, another example, you can think of them, think of the threads as like water slides. 
Um, so like you're waiting in line at the theme park and you're walking up um, uh, to get to the slides or the platform up on top. And if there's one slide, um, it's going to take everyone a little while to get on the slide, go down, you got to wait. The next person gets on the slide, they go down, you got to wait. Um, but if there's like four, five, or six slides at the top, um, then that line starts moving faster um, and you can um, experience the excitement of the water slide faster. Uh, and this is um, just an example of uh, using threads in Python. So you, you, can, um, you can use threads and, and you can um, take advantage of concurrency in other languages as well. Um, so this is Python. Um, you can do this by, you know, Im you're importing, threading, um, you're creating your objects. Um, uh, basically, your, your, you as the developer have to write this and manage this yourself. Um, but in Node, um, this, uh, this is kind of built in in Node. Um, and you use uh, concurrency or threads within Node using callbacks. Um, so, let's see. Um, so in this example, um, your JavaScript code is on the left side, um, and there's kind of this like wall or curtain um, in the middle, and then the threads um, and the concurrency is happening on the right side. Um, so, um, so all you have to, so all you really need to do is um, call your callbacks. Um, uh, and then your tasks go through, your process goes through, your tasks go through the threads. Um, once the job finishes, um, the callback is returned and calls back to the function where you originally called the callback. Um, so it seems a little confusing, um, but once you get a hang of it, um, uh, you can actually develop pretty fast. Um, and this is just an example of uh, what that might look like um, in code. Um, so you have a function here called my process. You're um, passing in a or um, taking in a data set, and then um, a callback function. You're doing stuff with your data set, and you return that callback. Um, and so the function uh, or the piece of code b below it, um, you're calling my process. You're calling the function, um, passing in the data set, and passing in a function which is kind of weird, but um, that function is essentially the callback function represented by a variable up on the top. Um, so, so yeah, that might be a weird thing uh, to think about, but basically that callback variable is this function. Um, so you call my process, um, taking in the data set, do stuff with the data set, um, and then you um, call that function, <laughs> um, passing in this finished string, um, passing in that parameter, um, and then it triggers this function. Um, and, um, and then you, um, you have access um, to that um, results variable. Um, so this is kind of like, um, like the end of the end of the water slide, essentially. Uh, so another benefit of Node is that um, it provides uh, low latency um, with high volume, so or low, lat low latency distribution of high volume of jobs. Um, and those jobs could be like requests and responses. Um, so essentially, Node allows you to process a lot of jobs and each job in a really small time span. So it's really good at data intensive tasks. Um, and if you're not familiar with the term latency, um, it's the uh, time difference between cause and effect, or for example, the time difference between a request and response. Um, so, <clears throat> this image 
is um, basically like a marathon, a bunch of runners um, running towards the finish line. Um, and each runner represents a, a task or, for example, a request. Um, and each runner is trying to get to the finish line as fast as they can um, and all together. Um, and you can think of node as kind of the finish line, um, but a really wide finish line that allows um, a bunch of these runners to finish at the same time or at like um, similar times, um, but basically a bunch of at one time. Um, let's see. Um, so, so yeah. So there there are a few benefits to Node, um, and some of the reasons why Mapbox uses Node. Um, we take advantage of this idea of low latency and high volume. Um, since we process and serve thousands of maps, and these maps are made up of um, a bunch of tiles, and each tile um, needs to be requested, processed, and rendered individually. Um, and we want to do that as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Um, so when someone um, requests to view a map, they're not only requesting um, one map, they're requesting a bunch of tiles. And if a bunch of people are requesting maps, that's a lot of tiles. Um, so, so yeah, so Node allows us to handle this um, uh, efficiently um, and also, uh, or handle these tile requests efficiently and also on demand. So we're not, um, ren we're not uh, caching these tiles. Um, we're actually rendering, doing all the processing um, on demand as requests come in. Um, and so doing that fast allows us to um, provide fast and beautiful maps um, to our users. Let's see. So, so we're using Node um, for our web services for these requests and responses. Um, so it also seems logical to use Node for our geoprocessing as well. Um, this also creates kind of a consistent pipeline from raw data um, to, to tile images. Um, and um, in addition, it also uh, enables us to use um, valuable and powerful C++ libraries um, via Node. Um, so back to this bridge example, um, simply put, Node utilizes uh, C++ at its foundation um, since it's written in C++. Um, and we at Mapbox use a lot of C++ based code. Um, uh, so, so having this bridge is really important um, and kind of gives us that opportunity to take advantage of um, these really great libraries that exist. Um, and are optimized and really fast. And um, so yeah, so it's, um, that enables us to do a lot of, a lot of awesome things. Um, also, um, also then we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, so, so on the node side, um, so Node Mapnik and Node GDAL. Um, Node Mapnik's been around since around uh, 2010, um, and uh, we use that for um, tile mill um, to render these to render uh, our maps. Um, so that's been around for a little while. But Node GDAL actually um, just uh, just came around last year, um, so it's super new, um, and we use this in Studio. Um, or Mapbox Studio. Uh, we also use this in our upload process. Um, so if you go to mapbox.com, um, like I said earlier, um, if you have a data set, um, upload it to mapbox.com and then you have a slippy map. Um, so no GDAL uh, really enabled us um, to make that happen. Um, 
and, and it, uh, not only enabling, in it, uh, enabling us, but also making that faster. Um, um, so node mapnik and node GDAL are pretty deeply embedded in our pipeline um, of creating tiles from data. Um, um, and that pipeline is made up of probably 95% of open source tools. Um, some These are just a list of some of those tools. Um, let's see. So, so yeah, so no mapnik and no GDAL um, are important pieces of our pipeline um, for many reasons, but um, a few of them, uh, they help us set up automatic detection of metadata, so automatic um, exploration of the data. Um, an interesting kind of fact um, in TileMill, so when we were using Node Mapnik, um, Node Mapnik allows you um, to render, but um, Node GDAL kind of has a little bit more, um, um, a little bit more ability to um, hone in on what exactly the data is. Um, so in TileMill, um, or back in 2010, in order to um, figure out what kind of file you were uploading um, or you were using, we were just relying on the extension of the file. Um, and the extension of the file isn't necessarily a valid, um, isn't necessarily a fact, like it could be lying, um, or could, there could be corrupt data inside, or um, yeah, it's not necessarily reliable. Um, so then with Node GDAL, um, that kind of gives us an opportunity um, to get a more detailed view of um, what, what is inside of a, of a file. Um, and that um, just improves our validation, improves our um, entire process, because um, we can rely on the fact that we know um, exactly what kind of data we're working with. Um, so yeah, so Node Mapnik and Node GDAL enable us to um, do automatic detection, uh, but also allows us to render tiles fast and accurately um, and support more formats. So GDAL um, supports you know, over 200 formats. That just kind of opens the door for, um, for how many formats we'll, um, uh, we, can, we can support in the future. Um, and we're kind of slowly, slowly opening these up. Um, so just um, a couple examples of, of some modules that are using Node GDAL and Node Mapnik. Um, uh, this is a module open source um, called Mapnik Omnivore. Um, and essentially, it, um, you throw it a file, um, throw it a file, um, and then it spits out the metadata of, of, a, of a file. So it's essentially kind of like GDAL info. Um, <coughs> And it gives you that metadata in JSON. So it provides things like file size, um, projection, um, layers. Um, it even optimize, It even um, calculates what um, the min, zoom, and max zoom should be. This is based on the file size. Um, and also, you can use this for raster data as well. And in order to calculate the, um, the proper zoom, min, min, zoom, and max zoom for rasters, we do this not using file size, but using uh, pixel resolution. Um, so this information can be really important. Let's see. Um, and then another tool, um, Tile Live Omnivore. Um, oh, and I should say, um, Mapnik Omnivore, basically it's um, it supports, uh, or it spits out metadata based on what Mapnik would, would ingest in order to um, render vector tiles. Um, tile Live Omnivore, um, kind of that same theme of um, digesting or eating um, and then um, giving you uh, metadata. Um, there's a, let's see, so Tile Live Omnivore uses GDAL and Mapnik um, to, um, 
obtain the metadata of the raw data, of raw data um, and then uses something um, called TileLive.js, um, which is another tool, open source tool um, for Node. Um, basically, TileLive.js um, um, let's see. Uh, basically, TileLive.js um, allows you to um, handle the whole um, tiling process um, using, um, like, from A to B, and A, um, the source, B being um, the destination, um, and those could be anything. Um, so in this case, um, tile live omnivore, omnivore standing for raw data. Um, we're taking raw data and throwing it up to um, S3 um, on AWS, Amazon Web Services. Um, so we're using tile live JS inside um, to create vector tiles. Um, so it has this function, um, tile live has this function called get tile, um, where um, Basically, we have um, different protocols based on the uh, format, the data format. Um, so um, we're declaring omnivore as the protocol, um, sending it a file, um, and we're requesting um, a tile with a particular z, x, and y. Um, and basically, this spits back the headers and also um, the data being um, the vector tile. So that could be really powerful. Um, again, with Node GDAL and Node Mapnik um, kind of happening behind the scenes. Um, and just um, some examples of like how, if you wanted to uh, write a Node module using these um, kind of a basic concept um, or like first step of what you would need um, is something called a data source. Um, so this is um, the main object you, you would use to start accessing that file. Um, and this data source contains kind of other objects inside of it, kind of like a, like a Russian doll. Um, um, start with the data source, and then you can go deeper and deeper and deeper into what data is inside of it. Um, and in MathNIC, this is what it looks like. Um, so um, fill out some of the options, file path, um, what MathNIC type it is, or what MathNIC format it is. Um, and then a layer, um, and then feed those options into uh, mapnik.data source. Um, and these are just some of the um, um, types of data, that the data and what it looks like um, using the data source. So what it looks like um, using in JavaScript. So if you needed the layers, you would use the data source um, and call ds.datasource.layers. Um, you can iterate through fields of each layer um, using i. Um, i here representing um, iterating through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, how many, however many there are. Um, also, um, for raster data, you can um, obtain or access the bands, um, even individual pixels, um, no, no data value, which is um, really valuable. Um, yeah, and then this dimensions um, uh, ds.raster size, that's the pixel resolution, and that's actually what we use in Mapnik Omnivore um, to figure out what the um, optimal minimum and maximum zoom should be. Um, and then a lot, of other, a, lot, a lot of other data that you can access. Yep, and that is it. Thank you so much. <laughs>
stores rendering them in sporadic ways or turning them into a JSON or rendering them file types. So there's going to be a track of thought for several of our colleagues to talk about that you can do with Excel. Thank you. Anyone else? So that creates the draft cell from the yeah. but yeah, as an output format. So the question was um, whether or not Mapbox is supporting uh, raster tiles, um, and right now um, uh, we're not supporting raw raster tiles. We're creating vector tiles from those um, from the raw raster data. So, so the thread pool that um, Node.js accesses is the same thread pool in C++. So I, I assume um, it's C++ doing its thing, or um, the C++ level, lower level. Anyone else? All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> Appreciate it.